Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house here this morning at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Uh, It's great to have the opportunity to be with you today and and gather around God's word together and praise our God together. Also, great to be with those who are joining us online today. Thankful that technology exists and that it works well enough uh, for other people to be able to join us today too. Uh, Our service today, we're continuing a series called Tell Us a Story, and Jesus, of course, is a master at this. Um, He would tell stories, and they weren't just stories that was a good story. He made a point with them. And we're going to see another one of those stories from Jesus today, and we're going to think today about how it's a story of reckless patience. Uh, Usually patience and reckless aren't things that go together, but when God does it and it puts his own son at risk, uh, we'll see why we we call call it reckless. And the good news is it's very good news for us. So that's going to be the, the main point of our worship today. Um, we also have some first graders who are going to be singing for us today, and we're really excited about that. Uh, so great to be here with you today as we begin this service, and we'll begin then with our opening hymn. Please stand. For our service today, we'll be following uh, what you find in your service folder. It's also on the screen behind me. Uh, It's also, if you want to follow the service of morning prayer, it's on page 207 in the blue hymnal. Uh, But for this service, uh, there's a couple of songs in it uh, that we'll have uh, an extra singer singing along with, in case any of them are unfamiliar with. 
any of you are unfamiliar with it, just so you know. Uh, but we'll begin then. Oh Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. The Spirit of Christ is revealed. Praise and thanks to may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, uh, first of all, from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 5. And here Isaiah is going to tell a similar story that Jesus will tell later in our gospel, and that's a picture of God's people as a vineyard. And the vineyard wasn't working out so great uh, because it's a picture of how God's people were sinful and sinned against God, uh, much like we still do. Read from Isaiah 5. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The word of the Lord. We will join then in our psalm of the day. It's the psalm you find uh, on the screen and in your worship folder, Psalm 80.
Our God also speaks to us in his word from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. And here we remember that, you know, through Jesus, the prize of heaven is ours. He's got that for us. Yet, we still live in a world with trouble, and a lot of people have turned against uh, the true God. And so God calls on us to be patient, even as he is patient with us in our sins. We read from Philippians 3. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again even with tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The word of the Lord. And I invite you to please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel for today is from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. The gospel of the Lord. congregation may be seated and we will invite our first graders to come and sing their song for us.
But yeah, thanks to our first graders. And we're also, we're actually doing a, a children's message. I forgot to put the rug out, so everyone's a little confused. But anyone who wishes, not just first graders, but anyone who wishes to come forward for a brief children's message, you're invited to come up now. And I, so I forgot to put the rug out, but I also forgot the little bin where we put offerings. So maybe one of the ushers, by the time we're done, maybe we can bring the, the bin forward. But you guys can take your seat, and I'll be right there. All right. Good morning, everyone. How is everybody today? Doing pretty good? All right, well, it's good to see you all. I wanted to show you something today. I got it here. Check this out. Now, who knows what this is? All right, I heard someone say, yeah, this is a trophy. Now, this was, is kind of a different one. Can anyone tell what? Usually, you can sort of tell what the trophy is for by what's on top of it. And this one's kind of kind of different. Can anyone tell what that is on top? It's kind of a, there's some wings on it, and yeah. Do you know? Well, it, you know, you might guess basketball because that's a pretty common trophy, but this actually isn't a basketball one. Um, what do you think? It looks like a fairy, but it's actually, it's supposed to be, and you can sort of tell because there's supposed to be stripes here. It's supposed to be a special kind of bug. Do you know, Malachi? It's a bee, right. So you think, well, why would there be a bug of a bee on a, on a trophy? Anyone guess what it's for? Do you know? Well, good job. Yes, this is the 20, 2016 spelling bee. Okay, my daughter Delia won this for a spelling bee back when we lived in Wisconsin. All right? And so they, they gave big trophies for spelling bees there. But what are some other things... What are some other things that you might win a trophy for? Someone said basketball, so I think that's another one. What's something else you might win a trophy for? Football. Yeah, maybe football would have a trophy. Um, yeah. Soccer. soccer. Yep, soccer trophies. I think I got a soccer trophy once upon a time, a long got, time ago. I got a soccer um, um, medal. You guys, sometimes there's medals too. So, yeah, that's true. Sometimes the prize will be a little different. Sometimes it's a trophy. Sometimes it could be a medal. Sometimes you might get a ribbon. Uh, what's another thing with a trophy? Did you have one, Ron? Bowling. bowling. Yes, bowling trophies I've definitely seen. All right, one more. Baseball. Baseball trophies, sure. Well, we probably don't think of God giving us a trophy, right? Because that seems a little strange. But um, one of the readings that I just read, it did talk about winning a prize. And, and actually, the words they use are kind of like a trophy, and I think I maybe get the right verse up uh, if, we, if the people using the screens can move it ahead. Yeah, so there's a verse here, and it says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, it's kind of confusing, but it says we win a prize, but the prize that it's talking about isn't the prize of a trophy. It's actually the prize of heaven and of forgiveness. And here's the thing. So usually to win a trophy, you've got to be pretty good at the thing. Like for a spelling bee, you had to spell a, a lot of words right to win a spelling bee. And to win a, a trophy for baseball, you probably have to win a, a tournament of some sort or uh, to do well or at least get a certain place in it. But the prize of eternal life, really, who's the one who wins it? Because it's not us. Who's the one who wins the prize for us when it comes to heaven? Yeah, it's Jesus. Right, you're absolutely right. Jesus is the one who won the, won the prize, and he says to keep going toward the goal. Right? We know that getting to heaven isn't about what we've done, but it's about what Jesus has done, and so we want to keep our eyes on him and think about how much Jesus loves us and how he has won that prize for us. So we're going to pray and, and thank God for that. Dear God, we thank you that you sent Jesus and that Jesus did everything we need uh, to go to heaven that he died on the cross, he rose again, and because of that, we are forgiven, and we know that heaven someday will be ours. So help us to look forward and to, to keep going toward that goal uh, to win the prize that really Jesus won for us. So we thank you for what Jesus has done. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if any of you happen to bring offering, we, did, we do have the bucket here, so you can put it in there before you go. 
Uh, but then you can return to your seats, and we'll continue with our next song. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, uh, as a pastor, one thing that people do a lot is they might ask me to say a prayer. And whether it's a prayer in church or just a prayer on my own. And I'm happy to do that. And and I always like for people to ask me that. Um, And you think of what, what people ask for most. And maybe it's when someone's sick or someone's in the hospital, there's gonna be a surgery. That might be the most But I think competing with that for the most requested thing that someone asks for is, will you pray for patience for me? And and sometimes they say it kind of like a joke, right? Kind of like, I know I always need this, but it's also not a joke because they know that in our world, uh, it's a sinful world and there's lots of trouble, but there's a lot of times when we need to have patience. You know, we think... um, especially on a day that our, our first graders sang, you know, what a blessing children are. But, but patience needs to be in the picture, right? When, when we're working with kids, and that's, that's okay. But sometimes people ask, you know, give me patience for that. You might need patience, you know, at your job, whether it's working with coworkers or dealing with all the tasks that come up. Yeah, patience is, is necessary. Um, how about when you're on the road and you're thinking, why is it one lane? Why are we stopping? I just wanted to get where I was trying to go. Can we, can we get there? Give me patience for this. Uh, uh, and then finally, you know, you think we get so busy and our schedules are so full and where do I have to go next? When are we going to have time to eat? You know, you do this and there's times where you might be asking for patience. What I want to know though, is there any, any time do you think when whether it's a prayer or when someone else needs patience, do they ever need patience for you? Right? Are you ever the source of someone saying, oh man, come on, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, oh, give me some patience for this one. And we might, we might think, well, maybe sometimes. But actually, and really this is the reason we're here today, all of us have required God to need patience. To deal with us. Now, we might think, I know some other people who I'm sure God really needed patience for, because we think, hey, I'm here in church on a Sunday morning, uh, or I'm watching it online, at least, right? And there's plenty of people who don't do that, and there's plenty of people, and yeah, you, you turn on the news, and you hear stories about crimes and things like that, and we think, well, sure, God would need patience for people like that, right? But me, you know, Sometimes we might think, well, I'm one of the good ones, right? I'm one of the ones that God can be, oh, good thing I have that one. Um, But we remember, 
God says be, per- be perfect. And every time we've sinned, and, and we rightfully rejoice that, yeah, Jesus has forgiven us our sins, but realize God has had to be patient with us every time we've sinned. And that's something we can be thankful for. In fact, that's, that's our main point today is to say, thank God for his patience. Right? That's why we can rejoice in forgiveness. And in fact, we're going to see that, that God's patience, you know, when we, at, earlier in the service when we called it a reckless patience, that's actually going to fit. And God is going to give us plenty of reasons to thank him for his patience. So as we mentioned before, this is in this series of, you know, tell us a story. And we're listening to Jesus, who's really, who's really a master storyteller, Um, And it wasn't, like I said earlier, it wasn't just a story for the sake of a story. He was always making a point with it. And and this is definitely one of those stories. And so we have Jesus telling the story to a group of people. And we just, we hear the beginning here. He said, listen to another parable. And that's that's his name for these stories. These stories with with, uh, an earthly story that was common, but it had a, a spiritual or a heavenly meaning. Jesus said, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. Now, Jesus, like a lot of these stories, they're not not wild, out there stories, you know, from a kingdom far, far away sort sort of kind of stories like that. It was sort of an everyday thing. And really, this isn't even too far off from things today. It's not uncommon today for for people to own farmland and then to maybe rent that farmland to other people who would do the farming on it. Now, today, it might be more common for the people who rent the farmland, they would pay a rent of some sort to the the people who own the land. And and this is sort of similar, but the people who are doing the farming, uh, their rent was kind of a share of the harvest, so in this case, we're talking about a vineyard, and uh, so the harvest would be grapes from the vineyard, and that's how the tenants were supposed to pay. And you notice um, how nice a situation this vineyard was, right? Because it says he put a wall around it, so to make sure no animals could just easily just grab all the grapes or something like that. So there's a wall around it. There's a wine press, so they could actually make the wine. Uh, that would be the common product from these grapes. They could make it right there. Uh, and a watchtower even. So, you know, it was set up, you know, this is kind of a top-of-the-line vineyard. Um, so it's really set up that the, those tenants could come in, they could do their farming, they had a perfect situation uh, that things would work out great for the landowner and things would work out great for the tenant. Uh, so, you know, win-win for everybody, except we'll see that these are not good tenants at all. Because we hear, as, it, as we go on, when the harvest time approached, he, now that he is the landowner, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. So it's kind of like collecting the rent, but, you know, it's harvest, so they have fruit now, so he's coming to collect the fruit. The tenant seized his servants, they beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. All right, so this is not just, hey, sorry, we're a couple weeks late on rent or something, they are reacting with violence uh, and physical violence against the people coming to collect the, the fruits, even to the point of murdering, you know, them. So terrible. And we would expect, you know, so the landowner calls in the police and there's a SWAT team or something like that, but that's not the kind of story Jesus was telling, right? So instead, the landowner, he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. So this, this tenant, or this landowner, sent a lot of servants, and they just kept getting mistreated. And when we think about this, Jesus isn't just telling this story, again, to make up a story. He's telling a very specific point for the people there. In fact, I wonder if when, when the first people were hearing Jesus telling this, I wonder if any of them were thinking of that reading that we did earlier in the service, from the book of Isaiah, because there was a lot of similarities there about this vineyard that God had planted. And uh, I just have the last verse of that here. 
But really, Jesus is almost picking up this exact same story and just kind of putting his spin on it. So the last verse there was, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Right? And so now he's telling that again, and he's saying, well, first of all, we're saying, look how patient this landowner was. You know, he sends people to collect the fruit. They're met with violence, and he doesn't kick them out yet. He sends more servants. You know, let's try again. And we might think, this doesn't seem very smart. Yeah, he's patient, but this is where we start to get into that reckless patience, because now he's putting people in harm's way. And then, as Jesus continues the story, which again, we, we realize is really about the people of uh, God's people, Israel, Judah, those people. And now we see where it goes from there. Because finally, this landowner, after he'd sent all these servants who get mistreated or killed, last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. Now, we hear that, and just that line, they will respect my son. You know, we just want to say, come on. How can you, how can you not see? This is a terrible idea, right? This is reckless patience, because now you're sending your son, and you think, it's, you think you're going to have a different outcome? You know it's not going to work that way. And also, especially for those of us who, who understand what was going to happen to Jesus, we can sort of get a picture at, you know, what the story is really about. It's about God dealing with his people, right? And you think, who are the servants that God sent to his people? He sent prophets. All throughout the Old Testament, we see these servants of God, these prophets coming. And did the people listen to the prophets? Sometimes. But most of the time, they wouldn't listen to them. And a lot of times, they mistreated them. And sometimes, they even killed them, just like the servants in the story. In fact, uh, the very last prophet before Jesus, John the Baptist, same thing had happened to him. He had been killed for speaking the truth. And this was happening. And then God, in his reckless patience, decided to send his son. So what was going to happen next? Well, we're going to see it here. Well, first, we're, we're going to have the main point that his patience is recklessly long. Recklessly for him, right? He kept trying. He kept sending more, more servants. He kept sending more prophets for God. And then he sent his one and only son. Now, you probably don't have to think and guess too much as what's going to happen to his son. Because when Jesus spoke this parable, from what we can tell, uh, this was Tuesday of Holy Week. So two days after Jesus spoke this parable, he would be arrested. And another day after that, he would be crucified. Right? So Jesus, in telling the story, is kind of telling what's going to happen to him. Right? And he says it here as he goes on. The landowner sent the son. Oh, they'll listen to my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Again, Jesus tells the story, which, again, sounds like a terrible story, but we realize, and the people at the time probably realized too, realized this is about exactly what had happened. God kept sending prophets. They would be mistreated. Now God was sending his one and only son, and he was going to be killed. And we see this, and we think, wow, those people from back then, from nearly 2,000 years ago and before, who lived in the promised land or the people of the Old Testament, they sure didn't listen much. Um, good, thing, good thing we do. Good thing we're, we're people now and not back then. And that's when we need to remember that really when it comes to Jesus going to the cross, when it comes to people not obeying God and sinning against him, it's not just the people back then, right? It's all of us. Uh, that's why it's so common to have in our services, you know, a confession of sin. This is actually one of the rare services in, in the, where we don't have a specific one. But the reason we do that is to remind ourselves God sending a Savior is important for us because we needed a Savior, right? Thinking about God's patience isn't just for those people out there or those people way back then. It's for the person we see in the mirror, right? It's for the people in here, 
because every time we sin, and God doesn't, you know, and sometimes people will joke about this, you know, oh, hey, I walked into church and there wasn't a lightning strike when I came in the building. That's, that's a good sign. Well, it's sort of silly, but we think about it and we say, well, yeah. Uh, the fact that God doesn't say, Shoo, done, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you out. The fact that he doesn't do that is because he's being patient with us, right? His patience is recklessly long and that's worth it for us to give thanks for, right? To realize that, wow, I have a God who, despite the fact that I sin, he loves me. And I can pray to him, and he promises to hear my prayer and answer me. And like we talked about with, with the kids, Jesus won the prize for eternal life that, that we could never earn on our own. What a blessing, right? His patience is recklessly long, and that's great news. But we need to be real with what Jesus is, and, and is going to say next in this story. Because we're going to see that, yes, God's patience is recklessly long, but also the truth that his patience will not last forever. Right? And we, and we see that in the story. And almost, to say that almost sounds like, well, that doesn't sound right. Right? Because God is always more patient. Right? And, and we've needed him to be. But, but listen to how he tells the story. And, you know, those tenants who were murdering everyone, um, they were sort of going to get it in the end. Right? And we see that des described here. Because Jesus asked the people a question. Therefore... When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will, do, what will he do to those tenants? And he kind of leaves it, this is a really kind of unusual parable where he, he lets the crowd kind of finish the story. Uh, so he says, so what's he going to do to these guys? Um, they've just killed all these servants, oh, and they've killed his, his son, and now he's going to say, it's okay, don't worry about it. No, that's not what the people said. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. They said, he's not going to take this forever. Right? He's going to move on. And, and he's going to get rid of those guys. Right? And, and Jesus didn't say, actually, you're wrong. No, he, he kind of goes along with it. And so, you know, we remember, you know, for the people back then, you know, when did this uh, return of the landowner happen? Well, for them, I suppose it'd be the day they died. Right? If they were rejecting Jesus and then they died, that's, that's when their time was up. And for all people, we know, you know how long, you know, sometimes we call our time in this world our time of grace. Right? It's a time when people come to faith, we hope, in their Savior. Right? But either, when, either the day we die or the day Jesus returns and this world ends, then the time is up, and then we want to make sure that we're found in, in faith. And, and the danger then is to think, well, sin doesn't matter. And I'm one of the good ones. I could never fall away. I would never be one of those ones who, re who reject Jesus. The thing is, that's, that's not an attitude we want to have. L listen to what Jesus goes on to say. He quotes, he quotes a, a part of the Bible. He said, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures... The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So Jesus is quoting here from Psalm 118, and that was written a long time before Jesus was born, but really the psalm was all about him. And so in this picture, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That was Jesus. And he was rejected by God's people. Yet, he's the cornerstone. He's the Savior. And Jesus talks about this to show how those who reject him, you know, it's not going to end well for them, right? He says, therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you to the, the people who are rejecting him that he's talking to, be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. So he says, you know, look to the Savior because if you reject him, it's not going to end well. And so we think about this, whoops, we think about this, and it's a reminder for us, you know, sometimes I've, I've talked to people where they almost get scared, and they think, okay, I know I'm a believer now, but how do I know I won't fall away someday? And, and usually, it's the sort of thing well, where I say, usually if you're worried about falling away someday, that's actually probably a good sign, 
because it means that you care and you, you want to continue in your faith and you want to, you know, like Jesus said, uh, produce the fruit of faith, right? You want to not just, not just think of Jesus as something that, oh yeah, that's something that's in the Bible and doesn't really mean much for my, my daily life. No, that means I want to give thanks that he's my savior and live my life for him. And if someone's worried about falling away, usually that means they care enough that I can kind of assure them, usually if you're, if you're concerned about it, that's a good sign. What isn't a good sign is when someone says, it doesn't matter. Um, I can sin now because I'll be forgiven later, right? It doesn't really matter. And that's when we have to hear that warning that God says and that Jesus points out that, again, his patience will not last forever. But the good news for us is that if we're alive, and all of us here are alive right now, we know, my, my next point here, his, his patience is there for you now. Right? We know time isn't up. We know that, yes, we're here hopefully as believers, as people who know that Jesus is our Savior who has paid for our sins. Are we going to be perfect from here until the end in this sinful world? Unfortunately not. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to stumble every day. We are going to turn to Jesus for his forgiveness and his patience with us. And that's really the reminder. It really comes down to Jesus. He is the ultimate expression of God's patience. Because do we sin? Yes, but we look to Jesus for forgiveness. We don't, we don't say it doesn't matter and I'm one of the good ones and I got this, don't worry. No, we look to Jesus. Because there's a lot of things that try our patience and sin tries our God's patience. But thank God that he has that patience for us. Thank God that he sent Jesus. And he says, regardless of when Jesus returns or the day we die, look to him. Right? He has, he has promised us that through his word, as we grow in our faith, that when that day comes, by faith we will be safe. Because Jesus' blood and his righteousness will cover us. His forgiveness will will be with us. And that's what we hold on to, right? So we press on toward the goal, but it's not a goal that we have to win ourselves. It's the goal and the prize that Jesus has won for us. Thank God for his patience and thank God for that one and only son who paid our way to heaven. Amen. At this time, I invite you to please stand. As we'll continue with the song, uh, We Praise You, O God.
You may be seated. We'll continue then with our offering. While the offering is being gathered, I invite you to fill out the Connect card that you find on each row. And those viewing us online can fill out the online Connect card also. Thanks. We'll continue with the section titled, Lord Have Mercy. Uh, I invite you to please stand. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. All right, we'll remain standing for our closing hymn. You may be seated. Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here today to praise our God together and receive his gifts to us in his word. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we do continue our faith night uh, this week, uh, and that is on Wednesday evenings. And so there's a meal beforehand. It's, it's free will offering, so, uh, uh, but that is at 530 and then from 6 to 7 is Bible study for all ages, uh, so hope you can make it for that. Uh, we also had some people yesterday uh, helping to clean up our grounds uh, for the fall, so thank you to all uh, who helped with that. It's very much appreciated to, to keep our church uh, looking how we want it to look. Um, we also have something coming up with Trunk or Treat that Mr. Ryan Carney will share with us. Thanks, Pastor. Uh, yeah, uh, Trunk or Treat is coming up three weeks from yesterday, if I'm doing the math right, uh, October 28th. Um, it's a Saturday from uh, 2 to 5 p.m. So all you first graders, tell your parents you want to come to Trunk or Treat here and get some candy on the parking lot. Um, if you want to register beforehand, there's QR codes all throughout the narthex and around the school. There's emails going out so you can pre-register, cut that time down when you get here so you can get straight to the candy. Um, if you uh, are not coming for the trick or treat, Trunk, trunk or treating part, or if you just want to help out otherwise, uh, we have lots of space yet to, to fill. Um, things like just hosting trunks in general, or helping with registration, helping with setup, all that type of stuff. So there is a sign up in the uh, hallway uh, outside of the gym. There's a paper sign up, and there's also one that's been coming out in the weekly church emails for, for sign ups. So check that out if you're able to help. 
And uh, most of all, if you can help donate some candy, that's really what we need. Our goal is about 20,000 pieces of candy, which is a lot, because we have about, uh, we've had 1,200 people come the last few years to this. So uh, 20,000 is, uh, you know, about 20 pieces per person. So that's what we're looking for. Um, so if you can help out with that, that'd be great. There's a drop off in the Narthex for that. Uh, cash donations are also welcome to help us just purchase on the side. So hope to see you all there. Uh, it's, it's a really fun event. We get lots of uh, great feedback and it's a really great time. So hope you can help out. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, lastly, we do have refreshments available. So there's, uh, you know, donuts, beverages, if you're into those sort of things, by all means, uh, come join us. Oh, when I said last, I meant almost last. Um, <laughs> but there are those refreshments, so we hope you join us for those, uh, and you're all welcome to. And also, Ms. Koss. For those of you who still don't know who I am, I am one of the new first grade teachers, Ms. Koss. Um, I'm here to announce um, the Advent by Candlelight for our women's um, group. Um, we have an event coming up November 19th. Um, and what a great opportunity. Today we just talked about how that patience that God has can end. So I don't know about you, but I was thinking about people in my life. Who can I invite to an event like that with the hope um, to share God's word with them? Um, so this is a great opportunity. That person in your life from work um, or elsewhere that you want to invite, this is something that's not frightening. It's a fun event, a bunch of ladies getting together to enjoy God's word. So great event to invite them to. It will be Sunday, November 19th from 2 to 4. Um, one thing that we are needing some help in is um, tablecloths. Um, we need about seven 94-inch um, tablecloths for some of our tables in kind of a creamy color because um, we hope to have a lot of people. So if you have tablecloths that could fit that, we would appreciate it. Um, also, just want to encourage you, it's going to be a really fun event. The only other thing we're asking for is that you bring cookies um, and then a favorite recipe, um, Christmas recipe. So it's going to be a fun thing to share with everyone. And um, we're going to be talking about God's recipe for patience, for joy, um, and our thinking is this will be a good event to prepare you for the Advent season before it gets busy. So um, there will be information on the Hub, and there will be an invitation going out soon. So we hope that you come. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So uh, before you leave, make sure uh, you greet people. And I always encourage you to greet someone you know and someone you don't know. Maybe think about greeting the person you don't know first, or else you'll never get to them because you'll be talking to people you know. But regardless... Uh, greet one another, God's blessings, and we'll see you again in God's house. Thanks. Thanks.